Welcome fellow Porsche fanatics. Today we're going to be talking about the much maligned generation we're going to call this. This would be the 1974 to 1977 Porsche 911. For those of you who've been around with Porsche for a long time, you know for a long time this was viewed as the least desirable air-cooled generation and the values were the lowest. I would argue that was always a mistake. However, times have changed, they've become more popular and I'm in particular very passionate about this generation of 911. So I wanna walk you through, much in the same way as I did in my previous 3.2 Carrera video, the various changes by years, the various models, a kind of a spotter's guide, and some things to know. We've assembled an amazing and gorgeous array of cars you can see in the background here representing a lot of the fun colors, as well as a couple different styles that Porsche offered in this generation. So with that, let's talk about this generation. So the very first car we have here behind me uh, is a very special car. This car is finished in a very rare shade called Hellgrun. It was also called Jade Green here in the US. I think the Germans thought Hellgrun would be offensive to people. Uh, funny story, I actually took this car to an event and I had some lady tell me that that was a horrible thing to put on my license plate. So. Go figure, I try not to cuss in my videos, so we'll just let it be. Uh, but this is a base 911. In the US, they only offered the base 911 in 1974. Uh, you could have this in Europe all the way through 76. Um, however, in the US, we got three models in 1974. We got the base 911, we got the 911S, and then we got the uh, Carrera. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the Carrera in just a moment. So this is a 1974. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a 75 here, but I will tell you what some of the spotting differences between those are. Uh, but we do have a couple 76s. We have a, a beautiful Sahara Beige 76 911S Coupe. And again, they didn't offer a base 911 in the US, so this was just the entry level 911 of its era. The Guards Red example here uh, is gonna be fun to talk about because this car we brought because it represents what most people did with mid-years back in period. Okay, so we'll talk about what they did to this car. We also have a very unusual US only one off model, a 1976 912E, sort of interesting. And one of my favorite colors and one of my favorite configurations, we have an ice green metallic 1976 911S Targa with the bright trim. I just love these, I love bright trim. And we're gonna walk back here. Now we're gonna feature a car that was not available here in the US. This is a 74 Carrera. This causes a lot of confusion because there was actually two of these models built and Porsche didn't delineate a different name between them. This is the Holy Grail car. This car features the exact same engine, transmission, uh, basic configuration as a 73 Carrera RS, uh, mechanically fuel injected, 210 horsepower motor. In the US, our car looks the same. It's a wonderful car. However, due to emissions regulations, we did not get the MFI motor. We got the same uh, CIS motor that was featured in the 75 or 74 911S. So that's what that car is. So let's move over and let's start about, talk about 1974. So one thing that was happening in 1973, Porsche was building the last of what are called the F body cars. We commonly call them the long hood. The long hood cars are very revered. Uh, they're called a long hood for a really simple reason. They actually, shortened the hood uh, to put these new impact style bumpers, which were gonna be required here in the US starting in 1975. And Porsche really did an amazingly great job of integrating a design, uh, became iconic, these sort of um, little pieces of the bumper here. They just integrated this so much better than if you look at the competitors that particularly the British competitors were putting out, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, they didn't do a great job uh, with some of the cars, we call them diving boards on many of the other cars. Uh, so this was sort of a signature and a big change uh, for Porsche. This particular car is a very early example. This car was actually built in July of 1973. So it's one of the very first, uh, what we call G-body cars ever built. And so what's interesting about this particular car is it has a lot of crossover parts. So when I went through this particular example, we found all sorts of places where they were using leftover F-body parts. So it's kind of fun. Uh, so we'll talk about that. But a real quick spotter's guide. If you're looking at these cars and you're trying to decide what year is it? Well, there's a couple really good giveaways. Uh, if you have a 74, 
Uh, one of the big giveaways that it's not 76 or later is the chrome outside flag mirror. Uh, Porsche went to the uh, larger painted mirror, which you'll find on that Sahara beige car starting in 1976. So that's one dead giveaway. Uh, but then you say, well, how do I know it's not a 75? Well, there's going to be a couple things. So let's, let's move to the back for some really obvious changes. Uh, the single biggest one that most people notice is the rear bumper overriders. In, this, in the U.S., only the 74 got the small style. This style continued in Europe all the way through the end of 1989 G-body production. But in the U.S., we just got this in 74. You can see they went to the larger style starting in 1975. One of the other things that's unique about the 74 aesthetically that I really like, uh, I'm a big fan of, is the 74 still used the metal grill with the uh, displacement uh, badge on it. Starting in 1975, they went to the plastic grill that they used all the way through the end, again, of G-Body in 89. So 74s have some very unique sort of aesthetic features, if you will. Um, that's kind of your exterior spotter's guide. Um, Let's go on the interior and let's talk about what changes uh, by year. Um, of course, the interior was largely redesigned starting in 1974. Uh, they went to an integrated style headrest starting here. Uh, one little minor spotter's guide item on, on pointing these out, it's the dash style did change in this generation. So each year there are some little clues. So the 74 and 75 still have the, the separate speaker grill which is the same dashboard that Porsche used during F-body production. Then in 1976, that grill actually went away and there was no grill. So it's a one year only dash and a 76. And then starting in 77, they'll actually have the center vents that you'll find all the way through. Um, that lasted until 85 when they went to a larger center vent. A um, Couple other things that are sort of notable on these cars. Porsche did introduce two new styles of steering wheel. Uh, this is the basic wheel that many of them got. It's a four spoke. I would argue it's not a very attractive wheel, but it is correct. You also could get a seven in 74. They had the three spoke Carrera sport wheel, which many people think is the same as a later 911 SC steering wheel. And it's not, uh, it's sometimes called the fatty. It's got a fatter grip and the offset is different. So if you can find a 74 sport wheel, uh, it's kind of the Holy grail. Um, a couple other things that's interesting. On this particular car, you'll note, if you note the gauge, the gauge style on this car, uh, just the very, very early 74s feature the center button. And really when we pulled these gauges apart, they were originally silver and they just painted them black. So the F bodies have a silver dot. And I'll show you on a later car, they use a strike through indicator. These are just in the first couple hundred cars produced. Um, there are some little, little differences uh, that you'll note um, this particular car, too, uh, features an interior called cinnamon. So there's a lot of confusion about interior colors on these cars. Um, so a lot of people think this color is called cork. Uh, cork did not debut until 1976. So the 74 and the 75 have cinnamon. Uh, they also came with an interior called russet, which is kind of an orangey red, or an interior called midnight that many people think is black, but it's actually a dark dark blue. So uh, kind of fun. A um, couple other little notable items. Uh, the 74 and 75 used the early style shift knob, which carried over from the F body. You can see that here. And they went to a less expensive plastic shift knob um, in later generation. Um, and while we're in here, we'll look between the seats. There's a couple changes over the years. You'll notice here uh, the 74s just have a single lever for heat and still have a hand throttle. The hand throttle uh, went away after 1975, but in 1975 they got a two-part uh, heat. So kind of some fun stuff. Let's jump over, because we'll see some of those differences. Let's jump over this Sahara beige car, uh, because it'll be a good example of some of the changes that were made. Um, so a couple things. Um, this car was delivered new with a black window trim, which was an option. Uh, this car, of course, has the bright trim, which was standard equipment on the regular base and 911S, but you could opt for black trim as well. Uh, starting in 76, you could get the painted headlight rings to match uh, the car, and you can note the new style mirror, uh, which became standard in 76, although not on the 912E, believe it or not. 
the passenger mirror, believe it or not, was an option. So you, it's technically correct for them to have either one mirror or two. Um, one of the things that's sort of interesting, you'll notice none of the cars that we feature today have a sunroof. Uh, right now, non-sunroof cars are really, really in demand. However, in this era, non-sunroof cars are not particularly rare. Uh, I think they're still more desirable, but not as unusual. But let's look at some of these interior differences. Um, and before I forget, let's talk about this black trim because we were talking about this. Um, a lot of people think this trim was actually painted. It's not, it's anodized. And so believe it or not, this trim that almost looks bright in this video was originally black. It is just faded. And a good way to tell that is if you come look at this car and you look at the parts that didn't get exposed to the sun, you'll see what they once looked like versus how they faded to now. If you wonder if your car was delivered with either black or bright trim and you aren't sure, you can look at a couple indicators that wouldn't change. So a good one, for example, on the rear pop-outs, they'll actually have black rear pop-outs on a black trim car. You might be able to face it and see it in there. If they are chrome, then your car originally came with bright trim. So that would be sort of one of your, one of your indicators. Okay, so looking in here, uh, you can see a couple things. This interior now, um, and again, this car is more of a driver, but it gives you a good example of what they look like. This interior now is cork. And let's zoom in on, for example, on this door panel. You can see cork has a much stronger grain to it than cinnamon. It's a little bit darker and it's a, it's a lot heavier of a grain. Um, so that's one change. A lot of people will mix and match cork and cinnamon parts and then they think their upholstery person messed up. They're different colors. Okay, so this is the three-spoke steering wheel I had mentioned. This is not the uh, sport wheel. This is just what was available uh, starting in 1975. You can see this car does have under dash air conditioning. This is not factory installed. This is what's called VPC. The Volkswagen Products Corporation made this setup. Porsche did offer factory air conditioning in this era, but it's fairly unusual. Uh, and you can actually see too as well the, the newer style shift knob. That's the shift knob they went to starting in 1976. A couple other items for just spotters, if you're kind of looking for some indicators. You know, one, one tell, it's a 76, again, our dash, you'll note has no speaker grill and no center outlet. So if you ever have a 76 and need to do the dash, it's a tough one because it's a one year only item. And then of course, since they got power mirrors for the first time, there's a control here um, right on the, uh, the pillar there. And then we don't have a 77, which is kind of a bummer. So I'm going to highlight one of the changes for 77 that really kind of is in 77. They got the knurled lock knob that you'll see on the 911 SC and the 32 Carrera. It's here and there won't be a top on the lock button. This allows you to lock, lock the door that way. So that's one of the changes. Kind of fun. Now that alone is the price of admission, just the sound of that door. A um, couple other things. Because uh, I because I noticed we're walking past them wheel design. So in this era Porsche offered exactly three different wheel choices. I don't have one here, but believe it or not in 74 the standard wheel was a it was a steel wheel with a chrome hubcap. Uh, that was a, that was a standard. You'll almost never find that. Um, it did re debut for the 76 912 E. And the mid grade option starting in 1974 was the cookie cutter. So you'll see these cookie cutters on this particular car. These are in the original finish and they came from the factory in kind of a rough finish. They're not perfectly smooth. These are original, have never been refinished. That gives you some sense of what the original texture of a cookie cutter. They are a six inch, 15 inch, six inches wide. Uh, the most common wheel that people always think these cars come with, of course, is the Fook which was yeah, 15, point, uh, and 15 inch, six inches wide as well. Except believe it or not, in 1977, they offered a comfort package, which came, came with 14 inch Fuchs as a possibility, as well as the 912E did get the 14 inch Fuchs. One of the things that's kind of fun, both these cars have sort of period correct tires. I, I sort of like that, uh, running the Pirelli CN36, which is one of the tires these cars would have come with in period. And I'm very thankful that Pirelli and Porsche worked together to recreate this tire. Not only does it look good, it uses a modern um, rubber compound and it's pretty grippy and it just sort of fits the character of the car. So if you have one of these cars, even though these tires are ungodly expensive, I, 
highly recommend them. Let's walk over, because we haven't touched on it yet, we've talked a little bit about these, these two coupes, uh, but let's walk over to this Targa, because uh, of course they offered two different configurations in this entire era, the coupe and the Targa. And the Targa was quite a bit more expensive new, depending on the year, but somewhere around $1,000 more to get a Targa. Uh, they more, made more coupes, uh, but Targas in this era I really personally like, uh, because they have the bright trim. Just like the coupe, you could get it with the black trim, but for whatever reason, it's more common to find the Targas with the bright trim. And in particular, I just love the polished stainless bar here. So this car, it's a 1976 ice green metallic. And Targas are just a wonderful car for cruising, just kind of in this configuration. Roof off, windows down, um, or in a cooler weather, you'll get these cars, take the roof off, roll the windows up and turn the heat on. They're spectacular. One interesting thing about 1976 on Targas uh, we'll zoom in on that, is it's the last year you could get opening vent windows uh, in the front doors. Coupes, uh, they were no longer available after 1968, but Targa's continued through 1976, and it's quite a nice feature, I find. You crack those with the windows up, you get some nice ventilation. Why Porsche got rid of them, I'll never know. But one thing they did give us in the mid-years that, again, they got rid of, uh, they have rear pop-outs on all of this generation, through 77, although it was optional on the base 911 and 74, as well as on the 912E. So funny enough, this 912E we have in the background is one of the rare mid-years I've seen that doesn't have rear pop-outs. Sort of an interesting one. Um, so since we're next to it, we'll talk about this car a little bit. Uh, this is a 1976 model. And believe it or not, we always say Europe always gets these cars we didn't get. This is one of the few cars that was never sold in Europe, believe it or not. Uh, they imported exactly 2,099 of these cars. And really it was just a, probably a little bit of a marketing shuffle, a little bit of leftover parts, but they were phasing out the 914, the 924 hadn't debuted yet, and the US was their biggest market. And they were afraid of not having an entry level car. So they basically took a 911 and put a slightly modified uh, 914 two liter motor in it, and a slightly modified 915 gearbox, they call it a 923, but it's essentially a 915 gearbox with slightly different ratios. Um, they changed the equipment content a little bit, uh, essentially to make them a little bit cheaper. So for example, they didn't get rear pop-outs. They came with steel wheels as standard. They came with the four-spoke safety steering wheel, uh, leather at interior, but you could option many of those things. Uh, this particular example was finished in a color called bitter chocolate, which for a long time was really out of favor. Now people kind of like it because you might not paint your new Porsche this color, but nothing says 1976 more than this color, right? Um, one of the things that's really funny about the 1976 912E is because it's kind of a parts bin special, believe it or not, they still used some of the cinnamon interior in the 76 912E. Um, so sometimes you'll find kind of a mix and match. So as an example, in this particular car, um, I'll have to get rid of that. You'll notice it does have cinnamon carpets and door panels, yet it's got um, cork leatherette on the seats. So it isn't actually a perfect match. And I, some part of me thinks that may be the way this car came. I'm not 100% sure, but it wouldn't surprise me knowing what Porsche was doing in period. Let's move over to this uh, guards red example. This one's kind of a fun one to have here mostly because it highlights exactly what everybody was doing in period with these cars. Because again, they were maligned for so long. You know, my very first 911 was a 1975 uh, Euro base 911. It was silver on black and nobody wanted it. I paid $6,500 for it. And so back then, what did we do when we got a Porsche? Well, we wanted to look cooler and more expensive than it once was. So this car used to be white. And of course we had to repaint it guards red. So it was repainted guards red. Uh, someone put a later uh, turbo style tail on it. I would argue a turbo tail never belongs on one of these cars. I think it's visually too heavy. Um, I'm gonna open the engine. I'm gonna show you what happened back here too. But you can see this is a turbo style tail based on here, uh, which really doesn't belong on here. It's ungodly heavy as well. And then you'll notice the motor is a three liter 911 SC motor very, very common back in period, which leads me to our next topic, which is motors. So let's talk about motors here. 
I'm going to go over to the Helgren car as an example of an original car, how they came. So these all came with 2.7 liter motors. You'll notice the displacement tag. And one of the reasons these cars got a bad reputation was that uh, certain people in the Porsche community during this period of time had a lot of negative things to say about this motor. So let's talk about this. Okay. The F body cars outside of the Carrera RS used a 2.4 liter engine. And for a long time, the feeling was that 2.4 liters was the, the largest capacity that Porsche could use with the case. But then our friends at Molly developed a new uh, technology called Nicosil, which allowed them to make slightly uh, bigger displacement using that technology. And so the 2.7 came out in the 73 Carrera RS. Um, not that this is the same motor as that, but same displacement. Uh, they used a case called the 7R, and it's a magnesium case. And a lot of people say, oh, they're bad because they have a magnesium case. What I tell people is you're failing Porsche History 101 here. So let's talk about the history. The magnesium case first debuted in 1968. So if you have a 1968 911, the first half of them have a sand cast aluminum case. And then starting in mid-1968, they went to a magnesium case. Porsche used a magnesium case all the way through 1977. Uh, including some of the most iconic years. If we think about some cars that people get really excited about, the 73 Carrera RS, uh, any of the 2.2 liter or 2.4 liter 911E and 911S cars all use magnesium cases. So a magnesium case by itself isn't a problem. When it's a problem is in the following circumstance. The 2.7 liters Porsche did acknowledge was at the thermal limits of the case. And Porsche made some design decisions early on that probably weren't the best. So one of the design decisions that they made that was real challenging um, is they didn't make a front oil cooler standard, right? So many of these mid-year cars did not come with a front oil cooler and oil temperature is the death of any air-cooled engine. That's one thing. And then subsequent, 1974, we did not have emissions equipment to a large degree on these cars, but starting in 1975 in the California model, 1976 and the 49 state models, we were under increasing pressure to reduce emissions. And so they used some technologies, some ideas that we later learned were not the best ones. So in 1975 in California, they got thermal reactors and exhaust gas recirculation. So uh, thermal reactors created a tremendous amount of heat. So now you have two devices underneath the engine of the car that are generating tremendous heat on an engine that's already thermally stressed, right? Um, you add no oil cooler, you run it in a hot climate, and you have a recipe for short engine life. So these cars were failing in the 40 to 60,000 mile range when they were new. And the mode of failure has to do with the following. The case is magnesium, the head studs are steel, and the actual heads themselves are aluminum. And those expand at different rates. So as they got heated up, they would do things like break head studs and so on. And so they got a bad reputation early on, lots of failure. The reason that, that I'm not as uh, as anti the 2.7 as a lot of people is. One, I appreciate some of the, some, the uh, I guess the qualities of a 2.7. So a 2.7, the things that I love about a 2.7, it's, it's very revvy, it's very light. A magnesium case engine weighs less than an aluminum case engine, and it just has a certain personality to it. If you've ever driven uh, any of the 2.7 liter cars and you compare it to say a three liter SC motor, a uh, three liter SC is a great motor, but a 2.7 just has a little bit more character, a little more revability. I just sort of like that feel. It feels period to me. Um, but that was kind of what was going on. Uh, then it got even worse. In 76, every U.S. car got thermal reactors. They got the EGR. And to make matters worse, they actually went to a five-blade fan. You'll almost never find one of those. I couldn't even find one to use as an example. But going from this style 11-blade fan, they went to a five-blade fan which actually reduced cooling even further. So if you drive, for example, a 76, which still has the original five bay fan and thermal reactors and no front oil cooler, you could see 250, 260, 270 degree oil temps on a hot day in traffic. It is just simply too hot for one of these cars. About the, the hottest you wanna run on a regular basis is no more than about 210. So if you have one of these cars, the 74s were not nearly as affected because they didn't have the emissions equipment. Um, and a lot of them have been updated. Like this car has a factory oil cooler. Um, if you have an original 2.7, there's a lot of things to know about them. But a, what a lot of people did is when the engines failed, they put a three liter or a 3.2 in them. It's not a bad choice, but if you wanna go period correct, 
The only thing to know about rebuilding a 2.7 is it's the most expensive of all the cars to rebuild because the machine work is really, really critical. So you need to make sure your machinist knows what he's doing, uh, knows the intricacies of a 2.7 liter motor. Uh, back, say 15 years ago, you could buy a used three liter SC motor for three or $4,000. So when your local independent Porsche mechanic said, well, it's gonna be $15,000 to repair your 2.7, or I can, for $5,000, I can put a three liter SC, which makes more power in it. You can see where this is going. That's where most people just simply swap the motors. Um, in fact, the target behind us has a 3.2. Uh, that's also a great upgrade potentially as well. Um, but my big point is don't dismiss a 2.7, um, particularly if you find one that's had the right updates. Uh, really updates on these cars center around cooling. They center around updating the head studs to the later style head studs. Um, those go a long, long way. Um, kind of touting the, the, the intricacies, other mechanical differences between the years. 74s are unique. They didn't get all the emissions equipment. They got uh, a shorter uh, gear ratio. So they have a 731 final ring and pinion. Starting in 75, really for fuel economy reasons, they went to a uh, 831 ring and pinion. So they're a little bit more comfortable as a cruiser, but the 74s feel the snappiest. Um, and horsepower dropped. So in 1974, the base 911, 150 horsepower, 175 for the S or the US Carrera. The Euro Carrera was 210. In 1975, power output dropped to 143 um, for the base. I guess the base wasn't even here. For the, the, for the 911 S was 165 here. Um, and again, the Euro Carrera was still 210. We didn't get that car. Um, so they dropped in power and they had taller gearing. So the 74 is the fastest of all of them. Um, in fact, power wise, performance wise, very similar to an SC or a 3.2 because of weight. So as an example, I, I've weighed this car. This car weighs 2,280 pounds. Um, so what happened is while they gained more power through the SC generation, they put on kind of commiserate weights. So the power to weight ratio is about the same. So mid years tend to be pretty light because they're light on options. Even if you get to, for example, a 76 or 77, and it has things like sport seats, and it's got a sunroof, and it's got AC, and it's got full leather, and it's got a few more options, all of a sudden you'll start seeing 2,500, 2,550. Um, I've seen ones 2,600 pounds. So that makes a big difference. Again, taller gears and less power. So um, the snappiest, again, of all are gonna be the 74, excluding the career that we have behind us, of course. Um, so that's engines. Um, since we haven't touched on, we'll talk about the 912E because it is sort of a unique uh, engine configuration. Again, this is the 914 two liter uh, engine essentially. There's a few very minor changes, but we'll, we'll leave it at that. Uh, these made a whopping 86 horsepower. Um, so a lot of people think, well, gosh, how could a car with 86 horsepower be any fun? Um, you'd be surprised. It's it's about as fast as some of its in-period competitor, things like MGBs. Um, but what they are is they're really light and they're, they're zippy. So they're not fast, but they're enjoyable. There's a certain joy in driving this car. And they have less mass in the rear end of the car. So from a handling perspective, they handle just like a 911, except for you can almost even see this. The engine actually sits farther back in the engine bay and weighs significantly less than a standard air-cooled 911 motor. Um, so for a lot of people, these are a really good entree point uh, into 911 ownership. I really like them. You know, again, a lot of people think, oh, I couldn't have that. One unique feature on 912E is they get a rain tray, uh, which is kind of nice. It keeps moisture off the engine. For whatever reason, we never had that with a 911, but they do on a 912E. You know, one of the things about mid-years that makes me so passionate about these cars, a lot of people say, well, you know, why would I pick a mid-year over a later 911SC or a 3.2 Carrera that in theory is a more developed or better car? And there's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the things that I love about the 70s cars and the mid-year cars is I personally, I love the styling. I love the color palette. I mean, talk about when Porsche was actually being brave and bold. Uh, nowadays, if you go to a new Porsche dealer, you know, shades of gray and black and white um, just bores me to tears. When I see an array like this, I just get really excited. In particular, I just like it with the bright window trims. I, I like the, the narrow body. It's just sort of a delicate and gorgeous car, much as I wish, you know, Porsche had designed it. So um, what I want to talk a little bit about is 
what was happening with color, you know, what colors were available. And so for that, uh, I always have to give credit where credit is due uh, for people that have done amazing work ahead of me. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this book here. It's called The Career of 2.7. This is written by a good friend of mine, Ryan Snodgrass. We're actually doing this video live actually from his location. And he spent a tremendous amount of time researching and talking about this cars. And so I'm going to talk about the book. If you're interested in mid-years, I would highly recommend you purchase this book. Um, it is not an inexpensive investment, but nothing worthwhile is inexpensive in my world. And he just did an amazing, amazing job. And it's specific to the Euro MFI Carrera. However, the vast majority of the information fits with any mid-year. So he spent a lot of time showing all the various colors. So this is 1974 and 1975. You can see the array of color. I don't see a boring color on the palette. It's really impressive. I want to I want to hire whoever was making color choices for Porsche in period. Uh, just some gorgeous cars, you know, birch green and gulf blue, magenta, uh, aubergine. Um, sadly, again, these were colors that people decided weren't cool in about 1992 and they painted it guards red. And of course, now when you go to an event, people are dying for that color. 1976, they changed the colors again, but they got some amazing colors, colors like apple green ice blue, Sahara beige, we have that back here. One of my favorites, uh, Ascot green, just a spectacular color. Uh, Continental orange, I'm very familiar with that color. Um, and this book just serves as a great reference. I wanna highlight one of the other things uh, that this does a great job and why I love this book is it shows a lot about the paint process in period. So Porsche was doing an amazing job with their paint process here. Um, but you can see period photos of actually the cars being painted. They were actually painted by human beings, believe it or not, back then. Um, but they also have this great diagram which shows the process that Porsche went through to paint these cars. Um, a lot of people just assume they rolled through the production line and someone slapped some paint on it. Couldn't be farther from the truth. You can see how particular Porsche was. And one of the things that this highlights for me is you'll see this step called quality control. A lot of people have this idea that you know, an original paint car will always meter perfect on every single panel. And the question I always posit to people is I say, well, what would have happened if a car got to this quality control section and they deemed that maybe the paint was a little dry on the roof? We didn't throw the car away. They sent it back through and you can see they sent it back through the process and it went back to paint and that's how they did the car. So the challenge I have for us is when you're authenticating an original paint car is you have to really understand what was happening at the time. So again, I'm, I'm getting pretty excited about this book, uh, but it shows, for example, they used to use an actual card when they painted the car and they would make notations if there were any flaws. Boy, would I love to get this card for my car. I would just be the best. And here's my favorite one. They're actually using a paint meter in period. So uh, we like to think this is a new thing, but you can see the, uh, the Porsche technician actually using the paint meter on the car uh, circa uh, about 1974, 1975. Um, so again, highly, highly recommend this book if you want to have a level of knowledge about these cars, a really good definitive resource. So let's talk about some of these uh, colors and a couple other things. So we'll start again with this 74. And because I'm so excited about it, I'll have to point this out. Us Porsche purists love this hood badge. One, because it says Porsche, but two, this is what's called an orange bar hood badge. These only came uh, through about the end of 74, maybe a couple 75s would have gotten them. And we'll walk over the next car and they made the next change, which is this hood badge. And this is, and you can see the little difference. They've got sort of a texture to the red bars, uh, slightly different color. So the holy grail for us Porsche people is an orange bar hood badge, much like this one. So back to paint. Um, in this era, any of these colors that were non-metallic, so the non-metallic cars would be all of these except for the ice cream, they were painted in single stage. Now single stage means that the, the color coat is the gloss. There's not a clear coat applied over it. So as the painter paints the car, each sub subsequent layer of paint is painted a little bit more wet and that's how the polish or shine comes out. On a clear coated car, they're painted flat and the clear is what provides the shine. So if one way to tell you have an original paint car or a good indicator is if you have a non-metallic car and you polish it and your rag doesn't turn a color, it's been refinished incorrectly, okay? The metallic cars always had clear coat and we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of that. 
One of the things you'll find is that the vast majority, if you find a mid-year that has original paint, like this is an all original paint car, the vast majority of the time, it is a single stage non-metallic color because the metallics in that period, the quality or the technology was not as good and they oftentimes failed. So let's talk about the paint color tag and how you know what color your car originally was. So Porsche was kind enough and they actually provided a tag here and that tells you the paint code. So let's see if I can tell you what it is. I can't quite read it with my video guy in there, but it's uh, 22791. So 227 is the color, which would be Hellgrun or Jade Green. Nine means it was painted at Porsche. If it has an eight, it was actually painted by an outside contractor, believe it or not. Uh, and the last number indicates the company which made the paint. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. A lot of people had this assumption that every Porsche was painted with Glazerit. That's not true. They had multiple suppliers and that paint tag will tell you that if you're a nerd or even care, but uh, people like me, we care about that stuff. So you can look up, for example, using Ryan's book or some of the online guides will give you some indication of what color your car originally was. Uh, let's wander over to this ice cream metallic car because we're gonna talk about what was happening in period there um, so again, this is a metallic color, so this was clear coated. This car has been refinished. Again, you'll almost never find an original paint uh, metallic car simply because the clear failed. And so when you, when you see a car that's had clear failure, what you'll see um, oftentimes is, um, particularly in high heat areas like above the engine lid, maybe in the rear quarter panel or above the oil tank, uh, it'll get kind of a yellowy or milkish texture and the paint will start going flat. Um, that's oftentimes what happens on these clear coated cars. Um, let's see if this car has a color code tag. I'm not sure. It does not have one uh, because oftentimes that doesn't get replaced when they paint the car. Um, but again, just know if it's metallic, it was always clear coated in this period. And if it was single or uh, non metallic, it's always single stage. I've had people try to argue with me, that's simply not true. Um, but again, that's one of the things that's really fun about these mid-years is just these colors. We think this is sort of a new thing. You know, we have all these shows centered around color, all these magazine articles around color. But really, this generation is really what uh, continued that on. The F-bodies had some bright and amazing colors, and these cars did as well. One of the questions I get all the time has to do with how do I verify what my car is, or is it a numbers matching car? Um, where are all the tags supposed to be? So let's talk a little bit about that on mid-year. So we have this trunk open. I've removed the trunk carpet on this car just so you can see. Um, and this is a great example because this car is 100% original and you can see how things were. So a couple things. They always get a VIN in every market right here on the tank. So for example, you can see this is a very early car. It's VIN 88. The first uh, 10 VINs are reserved for factory pre-production cars. So this was only the 78th G-body car built. In this generation, they, they still had the aluminum tag. Porsche phased that out in the U.S. starting in 1976. Um, they still had the cutout in the carpet for a while, believe it or not. And then the later cars, they just painted that black. Uh, but this will have the VIN here as well. Um, and you're going to find the VIN essentially in three other places on the car. So here, here, um, we'll have one on the A pillar. I won't show it to you because the reflection will be so bad in the video, but there's a, there's a, there's a tag right here on the A pillar. Uh, just on U.S. cars, just so you know, in Europe, they did not require this. And then also on U.S. cars, you get this style VIN tag, which shows when the car is produced. You can see this car is produced July of 1973. And that VIN tag actually changed color depending on the exterior of the car. So uh, they wanted a contrast. They're either silver or black. So on dark color cars, the VIN tag is black. And on light color cars, it's silver and they're actually, you can actually, if you look really closely, you can see in the cutouts, you can actually see the paint underneath that. Sometimes on a repainted car, that's another way to tell what original color the car was. Sometimes you can see through that tag a little bit of that original color. So kind of fun. We already showed you the paint tag, which of course is on the A pillar there as well. And I'm not going to show it in the video because, you know, we don't want to help people out, but there is a secret hidden VIN number on the car. Uh, you can research that online if you want that. I just don't want someone telling me I don't know it's there. Trust me, I know it's there. I just don't want to put it in the video. Uh, as well as there is a production number in a couple places chalked on the car as well. Uh, let's go to the back and let's talk about uh, decals. 
Uh, Porsche used these here foil decals, and they varied slightly by year. But one of the ways you can tell if they're original or not is the subsequent ones that Porsche made or other manufacturers have made have a part number on them. The original ones, believe it or not, do not have a part number. So these are all original decals and what those looked like. And again, there were slight derivations by year and a really good resource on what's correct for your year uh, would be, again, uh, Ryan Snodgrass's book, The Carrera 2.7. So definitely kind of fun. Just as, a, as an aside, please don't shut your deck lid by putting all your force there in the center. It shouldn't take a whole lot of force. And again, this is always kind of fun. I had someone ask me if my S fell off and I said, no, believe it or not, this one is just a base 911. Let's wander over, let's talk a little bit about accessories since we had the trunk open. You know, what did these cars come with? Um, so I'm gonna show you what they would have originally come with in the trunk. And then when we're done with that, we'll wander over, we'll open the glove box and I'll show you some of the glove box accessories the cars would have come with. So if I'm passionate about color for mid-years, I'm even more passionate about documentation and accessories. I wanna know where the car came from, who owned it, who's worked on it, what it was, what it came with from the factory. That stuff is really, really important. And one of the reasons I wanted to feature this particular car is it has absolutely everything you could ever want. Uh, if you're a nerd like me and you're really into this, again, the 2.7 Cura book is a great reference. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the cars came with, and then I'll talk about what impeccable documentation looks like, and maybe how that relates to value and how it relates to verification of mileage, which is a really important thing in today's world. So let's talk about what the cars came with. Because we were just talking about color, one of the things I wanna tell people about that I'm most excited about is this has been an urban legend for a long time. Uh, this is your definitive proof. On rare colors, when they Porsche painted these cars, when they were done painting it, they simply taped up the can and they stuck it in the front trunk of the car because if the owner needed to do touch up, they wanted to have their original paint. So this paint can is the original paint which painted this car behind you. You can see it's made by Lessonall, which is the number one on the paint tag. And you can see Helgrun, the paint colored right there. So. This is the actual paint. In fact, when we did some cleanup on this car, we actually opened this paint can and used it for some very, very minor touch-ups. So very, very cool to have. So what came in the front trunk or the frunk as we like to call it? Um, so the toolkits changed a little bit by year, but this would be an example of a very early G-body uh, style toolkit, a snap bag, uh, just in as what's the label, and you can see what it would have come with. Uh, for the various accessories. Um, for example, the little Pudens fuse pack. Would have had a little hang tag. This is your uh, tow hook. You even have a Porsche branded fan belt. So definitely kind of fun. You can see some of the uh, drop forward steel labeling, that sort of thing. So again, what an original 74 toolkit looks like. And again, there's slight derivations over the year. Uh, to inflate the then new, because one of the changes for 1974 is they went to a temporary use spare because they increased the fuel tank to 21 and a half gallons, kind of nice. And so they had to do a temporary use spare. So you got this here, uh, Electro Air by Webster Compressor, and this has been the instructions that would have come with it. Because Porsche was so nice and kind to their drivers, they didn't want you putting a dirty wheel into your car, they gave you a pair of uh, gloves by Oafix to keep your hands clean. And then you actually even got a plastic bag which was labeled BF Goodrich. This is almost unobtainium to find a bag like this. And that's what the tire would have come in. BF Goodrich was the original manufacturer of the spare tire. A um, Couple other things that would have come with the car that are kind of fun. Um, would have actually come with three keys. I actually have the third key. I forgot to bring it today. A third would be a red. That would be sort of the valet, if you will. So two master keys. This is actually the key for the um, uh, antenna, the manual antenna. Oftentimes they did come with a period accessory pouch for the keys as well as a little antenna cleaner. Kind of fun stuff. Let's talk about what would have come in the glove box. In the glove box you would have gotten uh, a red case. Uh, the liner color changed. There doesn't seem to be rhyme or reason to what that looked like. Uh, but what you got, of course, was the original owner's manual. What that looks like in period um, a little thing talking about the emissions system in 1974, a um, little technical specifications manual. 
those all would have come tucked into this pouch here in the front glove box. Uh, a couple other things that are kind of fun and where I get really excited, uh, if you would have bought this car new, this is the original window sticker, which was hanging in the window. This car was sold new uh, actually at Felton Porsche Audi, um, the original owner car. This is its original pre-delivery inspection. So this would have showed you what the original technician was inspecting for once it arrived at the dealership. And then other fun stuff, original purchase invoice, you know, showing the car. $10,840, it looks like. Kind of fun. Um, and then all, all sorts of other fun stuff. The original key tag, you know, the keys originally had key codes, so we know what the key codes are. Uh, it's very first service invoice at Allen Johnson Porsche. Um, so one of the things that's most exciting about these cars is when it comes to mileage, most of these cars are what we're going to call true miles unknown. Uh, a car that's not true miles unknown has very known history. So what I always tell people is do not buy a car based on what the odometer says unless two things are, are present. One, you have sort of unbreachable chain of documentation which proves that to be the true mileage. And then the other thing is make sure the car, the condition is a bellwether for its miles. Meaning I'll have customers tell me they bought a 40,000 mile car but it looks like a 200,000 mile car. Well then really what are you buying? Um, I have no problem with a 200,000 mile car. They can be a great car, just don't pay 40,000 mile money for a 200,000 mile car. Um, so like with a car like this is I've got every record on this car from its very first in service all the way to current, all kind of in an organized pouch. And then just other period fun stuff when the car was shown at San Diego Parade in 1977 um, and so on. Which of course leads me to the next one which is the certificate of authenticity. Porsche has changed this program a few times over the years. Um, they no longer offer this style certificate. Um, now they have a Porsche production specification. You need to take the car into the Porsche dealer and they will inspect it. Um, I won't go into that, but uh, suffice it to say this old style is nice because it will provide you the engine number and the transmission number, which can of course be found on the engine and transmission. Uh, I can't show you engine or the transmission number in the video. The engine one is very easy to find. It's just on the passenger side of the uh, fan on these cars. Uh, but again, um, the thing that's nice is, in this case, I know exactly how the car was built because I have all its original documentation. But in case you didn't, uh, this would be a good resource. And then simply because I'm a nerd for these things, uh, as we were cleaning up this car, it was just kind of fun to me. You know, we created a book. And so in this book, we walk through all the documentation, you know, everything there is to know about this, this particular car, again, showing the the paint can, um, showing the car when I actually picked it up from its original owner, you know, the car being used in period um, down at Riverside. I was shown in the parade in 1975 in Seattle and on and on. Actually kind of fun, here's a picture of the original owner and his wife with Ferry Porsche and a letter thanking, uh, thanking them and, and just sort of uh, from Ferry Porsche. So kind of fun stuff, you know, that, that makes a car uh, sort of fun. So, you know, why this stuff is important um, doesn't make it a better car, but again, it sort of verifies the history. You know, as it relates to value in today's market, a fully documented car is worth a significant premium over an undocumented car. Again, don't get hung up on it if you're looking for a car to drive and enjoy. A car with no history, as long as you kind of know what, what you're working with currently is just fine. Um, but if you're looking for a collectible quality example, documentation uh, does matter. Okay, we want to talk a little bit about what special editions did Porsche offer during this generation. They really can be summarized as just three basic models. Uh, so in 1975, Porsche made the 25th anniversary edition car, which confuses some people because of course they made another 25th anniversary in 1989. And you think, well, how could you celebrate the 25th 14 years apart? The 911, the 25th celebrates 25 years of Porsche. The 1989 celebrates 25 years of the 911. So just a little distinction there. Um, both those cars were actually silver, believe it or not. So the 75 is silver metallic and had a kind of a very cool, I wish we had one here interior, um, kind of in a navy with a, I don't even know what the right term for it is, but they're very unique. They've got a numbered plaque. Oftentimes it's hard to pick out that you have one because they didn't get a unique VIN number. 
So sometimes people will say they have an anniversary car and they really don't, or some people, they have one that was, for example, later painted guards red, and they just don't know it once was an anniversary car. So kind of a unique car, only built in 1975. Then in 1976, they did an edition called the Ferry Porsche Signature Edition. Very creatively named because Ferry Porsche had a signature on the steering wheel. Um, those cars are a gazelle metallic um, with a match painted cookie cutters um, in gold. Um, and they're sort of a unique, and those came either coupe or targa, kind of fun. Uh, so those are 76. And then of course we can't forget the Carrera. So again, here in the US, we only got the Carrera for two years, it's 74 and 75. They look the same. This particular car I'm, I'm looking at is the Euro version, um, but it, it looks identical essentially to the US car, uh, mechanically different. So they just carried over the mechanics from a regular 911S CIS motor, um, but they did get the flared rear fenders. They got six and seven inch wheels in 74. They later went to uh, sevens and eights. But the cool thing is in 1974, they actually did get a ducktail spoiler. Uh, here in the US, believe it or not, the only car that, or the only car that always got it was the 74. Uh, believe it or not, in Germany, they, they were not allowed to have the, uh, the ducktail. Uh, other markets were, but not in Germany. So uh, everyone loves the ducktail. And then they did have this car in 1975, which featured the, for the first time uh, a different style spoiler that a lot of people will commonly call the career spoiler or the, um, the whale tail, if you will. Uh, that debuted in 1975 for the U.S. A lot of people ask, you know, what the premium is for uh, a U.S. Carrera. They do bring a premium, but nowhere near the premium that, for example, the Euro version would bring, mostly because they're not mechanically unique, but they're a great car. Uh, they oftentimes can be fun in, in fun, bright colors, although they most commonly had black trim uh, because the chrome trim was optional, a no-cost option. So you typically find them, they're going to have generally Fuchs, they're going to have black trim, they're going to have uh, rear flares, and they'll have a rear spoiler. Um, pretty neat car. Um, if I could find one, I'd really like to have a 2.7 MFI, so my good friend Ryan, I know he's going to find me one. Um, and of course, because someone smart in the audience will point out, well, gosh, did you forget all about the turbo? No, I didn't forget about the turbo. We're just talking about normally aspirated cars. But during this period, Porsche did introduce the turbo. So behind me is a very early 1975 turbo. So just so you don't think I forgot about it, that's its own video is going to be on uh, 911 turbos. So uh, that's what is available for special editions. Lots of fun stuff happening with Porsche. And now that we've touched on my passion for mid-years, there's so much excitement around these cars. I'm hoping after you watch this video, you're as excited about them as I am. Uh, the challenge, of course, is going to be finding a good one, but it's worthy of the challenge. I would hope that you guys would want to put one of these in your garage, or if you already own one, keep the level alive.